Welcome. Nice to see some familiar faces here. So when John and I were putting together the program for the Baltimore Digital Summit, we're trying to figure out exactly what type of content we were going to have, what speakers we were going to try to curate for today's event. And we were discussing with the other group that had started Baltimore Ad Week, and they were saying there were a lot of agency people that were going to be in the audience. So we felt it would be appropriate for me to talk a little bit about how Silverback Social works. Now, before I get into that, I think it's important for everybody in the room to understand the genesis of Silverback Social and perhaps how I came to be involved in digital media and social media. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of my history. So Baltimore is near and dear to my heart, as John alluded to, because I went to Loyola College. Now it's Loyola University of Maryland, fancy pants. Back in the day, it was Loyola College. Um, had a wonderful four years at Loyola and really enjoyed being in Baltimore and actually came back to Baltimore and married my wife in the alumni chapel on campus at Loyola. And we had our rehearsal dinner over here. So last night we got here, I was getting all excited, really some lovely memories about Baltimore. Um, so I thank you for welcoming us as an agency, Silverback Social, into the Baltimore metro area. We're really excited about it. So after I graduated from Loyola with an undergraduate degree in psychology, I pretty quickly realized that it was going to be a little bit more difficult for me to gain employment than I had previously thought. So I headed up back to New York and went and got my master's degree in direct marketing at NYU. Now the reason why I got my master's degree in direct marketing is because I wanted to be part of this huge exciting thing that everybody was talking about, this dot-com boom. I was like, whoa, I want to be a dot-com millionaire too. And my father, at the time, was a traditional marketer, had been working at advertising agencies for years and he was smart enough to say, Chris, this dot-com thing is direct marketing on steroids. You get your degree in direct marketing, you will have a phenomenal career in digital. So in 2000, I started a company called MediaPlex, which was later acquired by ValueClick. A year later, they cleaned house for MediaPlex, and we all realized that the dot-com bubble had burst. So the trajectory of my career was pretty exciting. I was able to sell software for email service provider responses, I was able to uh, work in ad networks that were cost per acquisition, cost per click, cost per thousand impressions, et cetera, and sort of be exposed to the entire ecosystem of digital marketing over the course of that time. All up until about 2008, 2009, where I was at a conference called the Web 2.0 Conference. And at the time, I was a VP of sales at an ad network. And I was really excited because I was exposed to all of these really intelligent people and everybody that day at the Web 2.0 conference was talking about social media and how impactful it was. And this guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, keynoted the event. And he kind of came out on stage and he just rambled about how he was selling wine from his wine store and how he was allowing people to come into his wine store and learn about what he was doing through technology, how he had harnessed technology to amplify everything that he was doing at his liquor store. And I was really inspired by it and I was like, wow, I've got to get into social media. Now before that, I was a director of sales and knew that I wanted to be a vice president of sales. But I realized internally within my organization that the only people that knew just how good I was, was my boss and my clients. And I was like, okay, that's not good because that's not going to help me become a vice president of sales. The reason why I tell you this is because I'm certain that there are some entrepreneurs in the room, there are perhaps some individuals that might not be so happy in their job and you want a different career and you want to take your business to a different level. And what I encourage you to do is harness the technologies that are at your fingertips and leverage them to communicate just how good you are and just how great your business is. And what I mean by that is when I was a director of sales and wanted to be a vice president of sales, I decided to start blogging. And because I started blogging when I would go on interviews for the vice president of sales, now all of a sudden, instead of just on the first impression with those individuals, I was on the fifth and sixth impression. All I did was take articles that were happening and I wrote my opinion on the blog post. So now when I would sit down, somebody would be like, Chris, tell me about what you were talking about, the fatal flaw for performance marketing that was really compelling. They didn't care anything else that said on my resume, but they cared about the information that I had shared on my blog. And I was like, oh man, I'm on to something here. This is really compelling. So by the time I got to the Web 2.0 conference in 2008 and heard Gary Vaynerchuk speak, I was like, whoa, I got to get into social media 
but how do I do that? How do I make that leap? Because the naysayers, when I wanted to go interview at social media companies, they were like, Chris, you have all this great digital experience, but it's not social media, which still to this day, I think is the most ridiculous response ever. I was like, what? I'm the most qualified guy. So I said, the heck with everybody. I'm going to take the energy that I took when I was director of sales and wanted to be vice president of sales. And I decided to start my blog in 2007. And I'm going to say the heck with everybody else. And I'm going to break the rules. I'm not going to do anything illegal, but I'm going to break the rules. So what was the first thing that I would do to break the rules? I wanted to work at the epitome, everything that represented things that are great in social media. And that was at the time and still is probably Facebook. So I went out and I purchased the URL, Facebook should hire me.com. Now Facebook didn't hire me their loss. However, it gained national attention. I was actually featured in fortune magazine for creative ways to find a new job. And the reason by virtue of that and doing Facebook should hire me, of course, I got a job in social media because the individuals that were doing the hiring were like, Oh man, this guy really understands how to harness this technology and how to gain attention and not waiting for other people's permission. So great, Chris, you're yapping on about yourself. The reason why I'm telling you this is because that energy, the idea that you don't have to wait for permission and that you can move forward with any idea that you have in your brain by leveraging for the most part, free technologies through social media is one of the most powerful things that you should understand that energy. That sort of idea where it's okay to break the rules. I grabbed that zeitgeist and I brought it into my social media agency, Silverback Social. Now, before we got started and before I launched Silverback Social, I understood that this beast that we call social media is not a choice. That the idea of social media isn't the opportunity to say, Gee, on behalf of my clients, we're going to do some billboard ads. We're going to do some print advertising. We're going to drop an email and oh, by the way, we need a Facebook page and a Twitter account to push out the PR announcement. That's ridiculous. Before you get started in social media and before you understand the true power of social media, I need you to understand a little story that Clay Shirky talked about during a Ted talk. If you guys are interested in seeing his talk, he'll do it but more justice than I can. Give me your business card and I'll send you a link. Clay Shirky talks about the idea that over the past 500 years in our culture, the manner in which we aggregate and disseminate information has changed because previously you would walk up to somebody and say, wow, what a lovely sweater. Where did you get that sweater? Where'd you get the sweater? Uh, quick, think quick. Lowman's. Wow. And they'd be like, wow, did you see her beautiful sweater that she has? She bought it at Lowman's. Isn't that incredible? Yes, that's incredible. And Michelle would say that's incredible. That's how information would it be exchanged from tribe to tribe, from village to village. And that was powerful at the time from individual to individual, but there were inventions that changed the trajectory of our culture. So 500 years ago, all of a sudden the printing press comes along. And now when I say, where did you get that sweater? And she says, Lomans, we could publish it in a newspaper and go one to many. And many people get that information. Now, while that doesn't seem like a tremendous difference, this changes the trajectory of mankind. Changes the trajectory of mankind. Starts wars, changes the trajectory of businesses, starts propaganda, can change the inflection and direction of where political markets will go. Hugely powerful. And as the course of time goes by, there are other inventions that change that radio comes to be television comes to be telephone comes to be one to one communication. Now you can call from one end of the globe to the other. Now when people are watching television or listening to a radio, they have a shared experience. When I think about the radio, for whatever reason, I have like this black and white photo in my head and I think of people sitting on the floor and they're listening to like the Lone Ranger. The reason why that's compelling and that's interesting as an invention over the course of culture is because when they're listening to the information and they're listening to the radio show, it's a shared human experience. They look to each other and they say, wow, can you believe that that just happened? Or wow, I can't believe that that just happened. I think back my days at Loyola and when I was in Butler Hall, the big event was we used to watch Beverly Hills 90210 
and we get the girls from Hamilton to come hang out at Butler, and it was the greatest thing ever. But we talk about what happened last week and what was going to happen this week, and we couldn't talk about what was going to happen the week after because it became a social, cultural event. It doesn't seem like a big deal when you just think about it. It's television. Wrong. Those inventions change the trajectory of mankind. Think about political debates. Think about Nixon versus Kennedy. Think about Nixon wiping the sweat off his upper lip and Kennedy looking fresh because he put makeup on his face. Because he understood the medium. He understood that if he could harness his message and put it on television and disseminate it, people would be sitting in a living room and they would look at each other and be like, this guy is it. And change the trajectory of mankind. So that's over the course of the past 500 years. Then all of a sudden in the late 90s, when I was graduating from Loyola and I was getting my master's degree at NYU, something changed, something really exciting happened. We had this thing called the internet, the World Wide Web. I think it's gonna catch on, pay attention. World Wide Web happens, and there was a gentleman from AT&T that tried to visualize what was going on in the World Wide Web. And he created something that was just his emails that he was sending, the websites that he was visiting, and something really compelling happened. It looked like a Jackson Pollock painting. It looked really organic. And to me, underneath a microscope, it looked cellular. It wasn't square, it wasn't boxy. It didn't look like technology. It looked organic. And the reason why it looked organic, because it was about human beings. It was about my connection to you and the email that you sent to me, and then my taking that email and forwarding it to you, and the engagement that we had, and then the website that we went to together. And the reason why that's compelling, because that's the final of the past 500 years, the most compelling inventions that change the trajectory of man, the internet is born, and if you take all of those things that I talked about, the printing press, telephone, television, radio, all of them, and you roll them up, and you plop them into that organic internet, Jackson Pollock looking cellular thing we call the internet, that in and of itself is social media. So what the heck do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that no longer do you as an entrepreneur or an individual or a business owner or somebody that's looking for a new job, no longer do you have to go to a newspaper and say, please, Mr. Newspaper Man, run my ad. Please, Mr. Newspaper Man, let me, let me write an article for your newspaper. Why? Because you can create a blog and you can become the newspaper on your own if you see that it should be so. And that's why I talked to you about in 2007 when I was a director of sales and I wanted to be a vice president of sales and I decided to blog because I became the thought leader. Why? Because I decided to be. And I leveraged free technology to create my own blog and disseminate the information and communicate to as many people that would pay attention just how smart I was. And no longer do you need to go to the radio station to say, please, Mr. Radio Man, run my ad. Please, let, put me on your radio show. Please, I have something really compelling to say. Why? Because you can create your own podcast. And you can disseminate information if it's between your ears and you know it, if it's between your ears and you feel it, you can create your own podcast and become your own radio station. And we all know what's coming next. No longer do you need to go to a movie studio, sorry, Hannah, and no longer do you need to go to a television station and say, I've got this great script, or I want to do this, that, the other thing, and, and publish this great, this great television show. Because you can take your own webcam, open up your laptop, and you can become the television show. And the reason why I tell you all these things is because it's sitting in front of you. Stop being lazy, stop pointing to somebody else, stop saying social media is hard, stop saying it's for young people, stop saying it's something that you can't, t that you can't tolerate, stop saying I hate it because everybody's looking down at their iPhone. What makes you think that what you're saying to the person that's looking at their iPhone is more important than what they're looking at? Get over it. The world has changed. And whether you like it or not, social media is happening to you. Whether you like it or not, somebody's going to take a photograph of you in this room and they're going to tweet it out to their following and they're going to know that you were in this room. 
I tell the story about when I was doing a sales pitch for Breitling. I love Breitling watches. And I was in their office in Norwalk, Connecticut, and I was telling them about social media and how powerful it was. This is when I just started in social media, and man, I was feeling it. I gave the greatest pitch I'd ever given. Boardroom full of executives. Finished my, my, my sales pitch, they're clapping. Chris, that was incredible. We love social media. That was the most incredible thing ever. However, as a luxury brand, we don't do social media. It's like, oh, that's cool. Went over the podium where I had my laptop, I opened it up, I went to Facebook, I typed in Breitling. What do you think I found? A Facebook page with 37,000 followers. The chief marketing officer that had flown in from Geneva, head whips left, looks at the VP of marketing, head whips right, looks at the director of marketing, she's like, that's not us. I went, no shit. <laughs> It was a person that lived in Jordan that was most likely selling counterfeit watches that because this person saw an opportunity and the technology was laying before them, claimed Breitling on Facebook. Now, that has since changed and that's all well and good. Breitling is now in social media because they get it. If you think your product is too boring to be in social media, you are incorrect. If you think it's not sexy enough, you are incorrect. I can tell you this unequivocally. I can tell you this because they are my clients. I can tell you this because when they say, Chris, it's B2B, it's boring, it's energy. I sit in a room, we ask them the right questions, and we get to the humanity of what their business and their product is. Once we understand the humanity of it, we create unique creative to disseminate in social media, and then we sit shoulder to shoulder to the people that might be their clients and may potentially be their brand advocates and we have a conversation with them because it's about human beings. It's not B2B, it's not B2C, it's H to H. It's human to human. And if you don't understand that, you and your business will get absolutely crushed in social media. Two and a half years ago, I launched Silverback Social from my home office blood, sweat, tears, and guts. I was hunched over. The first time I decided that I needed to get an office and go into co-working space, I hadn't showered in three days. Hunched over my laptop. My wife was like, what is wrong with you? You need to get out of the house. Because in my gut, I knew that this agency was going to be huge. I knew that businesses needed what we could provide. I knew that individuals didn't understand how to harness the technology and that I could help. My first client was a realtor. She came into my office, she was sitting next to me and I was teaching her about social media. I'm like, I'm on to something, baby. This is gonna be huge, this is my first client. My wife high-fived me, I'm like, let's do this. The first year in business, we grew 3,000%. I'm not here to tell you that what we do at Silverback Social is absolutely the way to do it because we change it minute to minute. Ask the team, my guys are here. We iterate. We pivot and we move. And if that's the one takeaway for you, if you're an agency that supports social media, if you're a PR firm, maybe you have a social media person, understand you need to be nimble. You need to create the processes and systems and allow to have trust within your organization so that the people can have the ability to pivot in real time and not worry about approval from the boss man. So I'm gonna tell you how we do it. Again, it's not perfect. It's not absolutely on point. This is just the way we do it as, the, as Silverback Social, social media agency. Social is our core competency. When we start working with a client, we give them a brand intake document. It's 10 to 15 questions. If you guys want it, give me your business card. I'll email it to you. I could care less. Why? Because I'm going to do it better than you. We ask our clients information. We try to get them to be as introspective as they possibly can to understand why they started their business. Talk to me about your best customer. Talk to me about the biggest case study. Talk to me about the time where somebody swooned over your product. Once we understand that, we try to transfer the zeitgeist of that business into everything that we create through social. We go crawl, walk, run. Simple. Simple is really hard. Crawling is setting up the social media ecosystem. The core five social networks. Beyond the core five, find a social network that's interesting. 
the new thing, everybody's signing up for LO. Once LO allows brands to sign up, which they say that they're not gonna sell ads, bullshit. Once they get there, they'll end up doing it. Once they get brands to be on there, get on there. Squat on every social network you can get your hands on. Why? Chris, there's no way my brand is gonna be appropriate for Vine. Ridiculous. Squat on it, sit on it, try to create content. If it works and it resonates, then it works and it resonates. Try every single outlet. There are two ways of doing it, the easy way and the right way. Oh, Chris, it's too hard. I don't care. Crawl, set up the ecosystem, walk, wrap management around it. Create a content calendar. If the company's big and they have different moving parts and different people that are, that are touching it and that are involved in it and they're different silos, I'll give them a voice. Say on Tuesday, PR is gonna have their voice. Say on Thursday, marketing is gonna have their voice and ensure that they're able to have their voice through social, creating that content calendar. The other part is run. Run is where, cha-ching, run is where you close the gap, the return on investment. This is where you need to understand that you need to generate a conversion on behalf of your client. The conversion could be a donor for a nonprofit like the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. The conversion could be just getting somebody excited about Something else that they hadn't even realized has to do with energy, Blue Rock Energy. We, they power the Buffalo Bills and they, they define the most energetic player. That's a conversion for them. Somebody votes for the most energetic player at the Buffalo Bills game, they're mentioning Blue Rock Energy, that's a conversion for them, fantastic. Crawl, walk, run. The way we do it internally is create, connect, calibrate. Again, simple, crawl, walk, run, create, connect, calibrate. That's my whole agency. Create means creating custom, unique, creative. I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, a woman said, I want you to come in and I want you to pitch your creative. I want to see your most compelling creative. And I said, I'm sorry, we're not the right agency for you. The guy that brought me into the meeting almost died. I could care less. You want to know why? Because when the appropriate creative for social media will be born from the community. It will be born from the community. If you think for one second you can create something and plop it into an ecosystem without having appropriate reverence for that ecosystem, for, without having appropriate understanding of how they communicate, how they talk to each other, what gets them excited about the brand, you are sorely mistaken. Give it a month, give it two months, get the community managers listening to what's happening on the ground and let them drive the creative process. Let them come to you and have the ability to say, this is what works, this is what doesn't work, here's how we need to change it, let's iterate on the creative. Create, connect, connect is community management. We have four person pods that get assigned to every account. We have a senior brand strategist that comes up with the cool ideas. His ear is to the ground, he's listening to everything that's happening. We have a senior community manager, a regular community manager, and a project manager. If you think for one second you can give somebody half a job to be responsible for social media within your organization, you are sorely mistaken and you ain't doing it right because you're using social media as a publishing platform. Stop thinking of social media as a platform for you to just put your PR announcement. That's not what it's there for and it will implode. And this is why you're not getting the numbers that your boss is asking for. Because you're not putting in the time and you're not putting in the work. Calibrate. It's a qualitative endeavor for sure. I understand that. Well, how do you define a conversation? How do you, how do you put a number to a conversation? It's a little bit easier than you think. You get Google Analytics, understand where the traffic is coming from, have registrations, maybe there are ticket sales. We work with a large movie studio, and I, we did a post-mortem on a movie. And I said, here's part of the reporting. And part of the reporting was a fan of the movie saying, oh shit. Why was that compelling? Because they were on the fence about buying a ticket. We had the processes in place where we could give them content, marketing content, that was a really cool interactive bit of marketing content that leveraged Facebook Connect that was designed by another agency. And then the final part was a conversion to buy a ticket with something creepy added in the middle because it was a horror movie. That oh shit is huge success for us. That oh shit can't be put into a spreadsheet. That oh shit is success. Create, connect, calibrate, crawl, walk, run. Don't ask for permission. Eyes and ears open today. We've curated a ridiculously powerful list of speakers. I hope you have fun. 
Thanks for having us, Baltimore. Let's get it going. <laughs> <laughs>